We're going to introduce uh, Dennis Ralston. 27 national titles. He's one of the few players who have won the Davis Cup as a player. That was in 1963 against Australia. And as a captain in 1975. In 1987, Richard Dennis Ralston was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. And for more than 50 years, he's been a fabulous ambassador to the Bakersfield Racquet Club. It's wonderful to have you back. Thank you. It's definitely uh, quite emotional for me to be back here. Uh, some of you don't know that I used to wash the courts here. <laughs> Carry out the Barbie and uh, Chase. Marilyn Conley down the back always. <laughs> Did you know that out? Did you ever? No, I never caught her. <laughs> when I was pretty young, obviously, and, and um, so I, I, you know, I lived here. This is really where where everything happened for me. Obviously, it started at Jastro, which is still there. And I remember going to Jastro with my folks, and I, I'm pretty sure this is true. My folks were founding members of the Racket Club when it first started when Lake had the idea to, to build this club. And, uh, so I owe everything to the Bakersfield Racket Club. And, and I'll tell you a few things that, that stick out with me uh, about the Racket Club. And for example, this is the one place, I've been a lot of places and where when I was growing up, everybody would hit with me. And no one, you know, I mean, I see this in so many other places where people think they're better, they don't play with you. They think, or if you're a kid, they, and they, they don't want to lose to you. And I think two things that are really important in my career were having Dwight Makoff here and Alan Hodges, two of the, the nastiest serves you're ever going to play against. And, and, that taught me how to play against left handers, playing those guys. And uh, I, I always had pretty good results against this guy Labor that, that won a few slams. And, and Tony Roach, because of those guys, I never worried about playing left handers because they would beat me up like a drum for quite a few years. And so I learned how to return against the lefty. And the other thing was that uh, Lake let me challenge on the B ladder, he put me on number 30 on the B ladder. And they had, we had two ladders then, we had the A ladder and the B ladder. And I remember that you could challenge up one, and I think, I don't, kind of remember this, is I was gonna end up being number one on the A ladder when I, I figured I was gonna do it. So I challenged, and I don't know how long it took, it took a couple of years, but I got to the top of the B ladder. And in the B ladder, number one guy could challenge number 30 on the A ladder. And I was still a kid, and I was playing against adults, and I can't imagine how I would probably feel if this, you know, some kid was beating me, but everybody here really made an effort to encourage me and help me. And uh, I played John Cowan, I played uh, Bill Maxwell, uh, you know, Herb Benham, so many people, uh, John Eckhart, Jack Lynch, I mean, all the people that were the original part. And so I, I really think back, my career would not have happened in the game, um, particularly without the Racket Club, I would have never made it anywhere. And, and I think this is a special place. So to have you all come and say hello is, is so meaningful. And, and uh, there's a couple other things that, that Lake, of course, the vision to build this, and, and, uh, and when you think of all the players we've had come out of the Raptors, I mean, it's just phenomenal. And Hank and Hank Senior was, uh, I saw Hank Senior play here, I ball boy for Hank Senior uh, when the pros came, when Hode and, and Gonzalez came, and uh, I guess your dad, Hank, played a preliminary match. I don't know if you knew that. He played, uh, I think he played Denny Pales, but was a good Australian. But Hank Sr. was really good. And, and uh, so that kind of got my interest. Uh, Gonzalez hit a ball at me. That kind of annoyed me. And then Art Larson played here also. And he hit a ball at me. And I walked off the court when you had the one court there. And, you know, the club had the vision to bring those kind of players here for us to see, for these kids to see. I remember lots of days in the summer when 
all my buddies were in here swimming, and, and I would go out and hit serves in the back courts. And, uh, and I don't know why I did that. I just wanted to be able to serve, and uh, it helped uh, it helped me so much. Then I would go swimming. But a couple of highlights in my career, uh, basically, uh, when I won the Southern Cal Men's, I don't know if you if you know this, but when I was 17, I played in Ojai and I lost to Osuna in, in the Open, and uh, he and I played doubles and won the doubles there. And he was going to SC, and I wasn't sure where I was going. I was always going to go to UCLA because Bill Maxwell went there, and, and uh, I was a Bruin fan. I was a Bruin fan until I went down and J.D. Morgan was the coach and he invited me down as a recruiting trip and I watched him run a practice and he had some good players. He had Alan Fox, some of you tennis people know him, and, and Larry Nagler. And so I'm down there watching him practice and J.D. Morgan was became the athletic director at UCLA. He was a, a, a gruff guy. And, and he's yelling to Nagler, he says, Nagler, you can't play worth a lick. Come on, come on. And, and I thought, how would I react to that? And that would not have worked with me. I, I, I think I would have, I don't know, I probably would have walked out of school. So seeing UCLA, it was a great school, but seeing how JD ran the team, I said, I'm not going there. And I won the doubles with Osuna at, at Ojai, and then we played the Southern Cal Open. And I played really well. I had a good draw, so, so all the good players lost before I played them. But I won the singles. <laughs> I won the singles, and I'm on the center court there at the LA Tennis Club, and they, they walk out, and Perry Jones is presenting the trophy, and he says, and also to the winner goes $500 towards your trip to Wimbledon. And I'm, wow, $500? Wimbledon? I always dreamed about Wimbledon. I had no idea going into that tournament that I would ever I always wanted to play Wimbledon. So we had a $500 start to go to Wimbledon if, if my folks would let me go and try to figure out how we're gonna raise the rest of the money. It was like 1400 bucks or something like that. And, uh, and the racket club came through and paid the rest. And I would not have gone to Wimbledon without the racket club's support. Wow. So you never know, really, when you know things happen. And I, I took off. I had, the hardest thing was for me about going to Wimbledon was to miss my high school graduation. And people say, "Really? You know, I was 17, and I loved high school. I, I, all my buddies, the all night party I was looking forward to. <laughs> and probably one of the saddest days in my life when I was over there and in England and." It was the day that this high school graduated, and, and I was kind of, I don't know, feeling sorry for myself, I guess, but um, we went, I went by myself, I had 10 rackets, I think, and, and I had no idea where I was going, I was going to a place called Bristol, and I went to London, I flew a, I flew a uh, Comet jet in those days, it was two engines, or four engines in close on the side, a BOAC, and I'd never flown over the pole. I never flown 10 hours without, or 11 hours without. So I was just zonked when I got to England. And I remember I, I landed at uh, Heathrow and I took the train to downtown London and, and I had to get to Bristol. And so the people were nice enough. I'm asking how you, you know, and they said, you get on this train and you get off here. So I get on the train and I'm going to Bristol and there's an East Bristol and a West Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> I got off in West Bristol, I was supposed to get off in East Bristol. And I'm walking down the street, because the that was the last train for three or four hours. I didn't know where I was going, and so I thought, well, let's just start walking. And I'm carrying my rackets, and this nice little car comes by, and this English couple stops and said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm trying to get to the Bristol Tennis Lawn Tennis Club. He said, well, you're a long ways away. And I said, well, well, I guess I got off at the wrong spot. And they said, well, we're glad to take you there. And they, they, they didn't know me. I, I mean, they just took me to Bristol. And then when we get to the tournament, we find out that no one had ever heard of us, well, soon or not. And we thought, wow, we're pretty good. But then all of a sudden, <laughs> we find out that uh, the only way we're going to get into Wimbledon is if they 
if we perform in the three tournaments before Wimbledon, then they, they look at who, how you're doing. And so I think I got to the semis of the singles the first tournament, and we won the doubles, and so we were in. We got into Wimbledon. And um, we went to London, and we didn't have a place to stay because, you know, we didn't plan that very far ahead. <laughs> so, so we get off in Earl's Court, and we're looking for places to stay. But London's packed. I mean, there's no place. So we're trying to find a place. So we found a place. If you can believe this, it was one pound a night, $2.40, bed and breakfast. Uh, in Earl's Court, right across from the... Uh, air terminal that used to be there. Maybe it's still there. I've been there a long time, but uh, the Earl's Court Air Terminal. So uh, the one negative was there were 235 stairs to our room. No elevator. No bathroom on our floor. We were at the very top, the very top of the building, and we had to walk those stairs every day. And, uh, and I think that was one of the reasons why we were able to <laughs> so that trip, uh, you know, you look back, I was, God, I, would, uh, I can remember a couple things that, that the former uh, the players that were there said, don't, when you go on the stadium court, don't look around. You're going to see all these eyes looking at you. And, and people at, up at that stage had center court idols, they just collapsed almost. They couldn't play. They, they started looking around and there's all these people peering at you. And so I never looked. I never looked once in every match that I played on the center court. And uh, kept my head down. And we, I don't know if you, I, I remember the scores of most of the matches there, which is usually what happens when you win. <laughs> <laughs> so we won our first match. Against two guys from England, uh, Gerald Oakley and Humphrey Truman. They were there. They should have been basketball players. They're six five and six four. Huge serves. We're playing on the last court that was there. I think fourteen. It was terrible grass, and we won eighteen sixteen in the fifth set. Eighteen sixteen in the first round. And then it got easier after that. So we played the Italian team, the Davis Cup team, in the second round. Played on court one, did trans in Sarola. We beat them 6 11 in the fifth. Then we played the South African Davis Cup team. We had a lousy draw, basically. We played the South African Davis Cup team next, beat them. Then we played the Swedish Davis Cup team, we beat them. And then we played Labor and Mark in the semis. So we played somebody else between them, but we played Labor and Mark in the semis. And, and Labor was young, coming on, and he was playing great. He, he reached the singles final that year and lost to Neil Frazier, but he was a heck of a player. Bob Mark was a big, burly guy, should have been a football player, had a huge serve. And we played on the center court, and we had not broken serve, uh, a Mark serve, at all through the match. And it's like 9-8 in the fifth, in the fifth. We're up 8-9, Mark serve. And somehow, I get one back and we get an ad, and, uh, and he double faulted our match point. <laughs> Never forget it. And boy, that was like, wow. <laughs> so we're into the finals. And, you know, I, I think I was so clueless that, that I, I realized Wimbledon was big, but I didn't realize how big it was. And so we were supposed to play the English team in the finals, which we did, uh, Mike Davies and Bobby Wilson. And uh, England had not won a title at Wimbledon since Fred Perry. So, in the men, so all of England was cheering for them, and uh, they choked because usually the English did at that time. <laughs> <laughs> still, they still did. We were the Scottish, but uh, we killed them, and uh, so that was my launch into the big leagues and real big leagues. And, and then I went on to Ireland. I won the Irish Open uh, the next week, and uh, then I went to. Canada, they put me on the Davis Cup team, and uh, I didn't get to play, but I was, that was my first time on the Davis Cup team, and, and, uh, and my career basically would have not have happened. I've had so many people help me, starting with my folks, and uh, 
all you members here that used to hit balls at me and, and all, all the people I used to watch. And, and it was such a family club. And, and, you know, I miss that. I see it in, I live in Austin, Texas now, and it's, the club I met is somewhat like our club here. And it's, you know, it's, it's nice. It's not elaborate, but the people are nice. And, and uh, you know, I try to give back because so many people helped me get to where I could play the game pretty well. So uh, it's a great honor for me to be invited back, and uh, I could talk for a lot of hours if you wanted to hear <laughs> a lot of stories. But thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if you or want. Yes, sir. Prior to uh, playing on the grass and angels, what were the opportunities in the U.S. for you to play on the grass? My experience on grass was uh, I was put on the Junior Davis Cup team in 1958, and so they would take us to uh, Philadelphia and, and play at the U.S. in 1958, 59. Didn't do very well. I liked grass. I played at Boston with the National Belt. So I had some experience on grass, but playing on fast cement, in those days the grass was really fast over there, and the balls were faster than the ball. So it was perfectly suited to my game. I love playing on the grass. I had, I had enough, and then I just said, hit it. And sometimes they went in. So, yeah, my dad was a very good player. I think some of you know that. And, uh, he retired in 1966 in July. Uh, the minute we won the National Father and Son in Boston, he said, that's it. I'm never playing again. They had us national title on grass, and he never hit another ball again. He played golf, and uh, I thought that was a pretty cool, good way to go out. And, uh, uh, so, you know, a couple other things. I mean, I've coached a lot of players, and i coached at SMU. And I've been in tennis my whole life, obviously. I've been very fortunate to, you know, like they were saying last night at the Elias Hall of Fame, all those coaches and, and duffies, and, you know, there are some ups and downs, and, in a career and stuff, but I've been blessed to be in a game I love, and uh, I still play.